Welcome back, everybody. And today's guest is Damon Sway. How are you doing, Damon? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. So we got the chance to actually meet face to face at Nink, where uh, you were a speaker and just kind of hanging out and having fun. True story. Yeah, <laughs> that was great. And we had some interesting conversation, not very long ones, but we did have the opportunity to kind of touch on a couple of subjects. And I thought it'd be great to have you on and have you share with everybody how you've been making money from your words. Mm-hmm. Basically since, well, you tell me what age. <laughs> Um, I started, well, it's funny. I was a showbiz kid. I had, um, of course, when I was a kid, I didn't realize this. I had a freak singing voice. So I wound up doing a lot of gig singing when I was a little boy. I did a lot of voiceover and that led to musicals. Then musicals led to Shakespeare and then Shakespeare led to naturalism and theater. And then that led to television stuff. And I, I, w- I went to school at Columbia and I graduated a year early. I graduated in three years. And right when I graduated, I got offered, I had been a I'd been part of a theater company here in New York called the Ridiculous Theatrical Company, and a, a company from London came over, saw me, and took me to England for a tour of Midsummer Night's Dream. And while I was there, I got an agent and a manager, and I, st- I lived in England for almost four years. And while I was there, a producer came up to me and said, oh, hey, I hear you write. And what I did was sort of write curtain runners for, for benefits, like I could do sort of like a five-minute whatever sort of things. We, you know, when you have to do sort of that kind of benefit stuff, you're often setting up content for people to raise money, right? Mm-hmm. But I'd never written anything full length. And he came up and he said, I have a theater, but my a playwright just pulled out and I'm sort of stuck and it's four months away. And I was under such a deadline, I wound up art directing a photo shoot and then writing a play to fit the advertising. <laughs> and <laughs> seriously, and it, the thing is the play sold out. And I wrote it and I had written and directed it. And so at, from that moment on, I was like, yes, yeah, screw this blue collar acting work. I'm going to go be a white collar content creator. And so I really got involved in the production side of things, which I loved. And then I was a goner. So I've been doing this. I mean, I've been writing professionally full time since I was 21, 22 ish. Long time. Long, long time. And so uh, plays led to uh, television, film, comics. And then uh, back in 2010, a friend dared me to write uh, a romance novel. Mm -hmm. And I had never written fiction before, but I can never withstand a dare. And so I went ahead and she said, you can do it in two months. And I did it in six weeks and I sold it in two days and it was number one for six months. And I made so much money on that book. I called my agent and I was like, I'm never working for the Weinsteins again. I totally want to get into, I mean, the community in romance is so loving and supportive and I just really dug it. And as soon as I did it, I sort of, it's funny, I, I always say going to a romance conference is like going to a film festival, except you're the movie. Like you're always, you're always sort of engaging with fans and developing relationships, et cetera. But so I've been, I mean, I've been writing full time for, I'm now, I just turned 49. So 28 years, long time, long, I'm old. I'm an old hooker. I'm an old hooker. <laughs> so um, in, in doing that though, how is like, how has it changed for you to make money, right? Like, so I, I'm not familiar with screenplay writing. Oh, okay, writing. all right. The way I describe it is when you're working on a film, it's the way Australia pit the scenes would hunt a woolly mammoth, right? So you're like out with the entire village and you have these spears and all of you kind of hunt down this giant hairy beast and you bring it down. And then the village lives off the meat and the marrow and the wool for three years, right? That's what a film is like because you have, you have to have a giant collaborative hunt. Writing fiction is more like hunting elk. Like when I'm hungry, I can go out in the forest and I can go and find an elk and then drag it back by myself. And if I'm hungry again, I can go out again and get another elk. I don't need to have a giant army with me to bring it down, but it also means that the return is sort of swifter because I have to actually go out and get it, go out and get it. At the same time, you have a lot more control. There's more agency because you're not relying on the suits. You're not relying on the budget. I mean, every time I was just actually, I was in um, Indianapolis and Columbus the last two weeks teaching and someone was asking about movies. And I said, well, in a movie, if I add a character, I'm adding $240,000 to the production budget. Like I know if I put someone in, that's a quarter of a million dollars that I have to pay so that someone come in and say like, Sherry, did you want to date him? Like just that person on screen adds this giant cost. And in mm. books, there's still a cost, but it's a different cost. And so I'm not, I'm factoring in things like how much emotional investment does the reader make 
as opposed to do my producers want to fly an actor to Louisiana to shoot this scene, right? So it's a different economy. But I'm, the difference for me moving into fiction was that in, when I was working in scripted entertainment, and this even includes comics, is I was always working with a corporation. There was always some kind of a, a, a business entity that was using my words as a blueprint to produce something. And in fiction, I am, I am the building that the blueprint builds, right? So mm-hmm. in the film, I create this blueprint and then hundreds of people come in and help me assemble it, right? And I have no control. You're the low man on the totem pole in film. Mm-hmm. But in fiction, you are the totem pole. And so everything shifts, the dynamic shifts, which was fascinating. Well, let me, yeah, let me ask you a question about this. So there had to be a point back, back in the day when you were a young lad that like, you went in to write something and somebody schooled you on just what you said there. Like, you know, you just added $200,000 to what we're doing here. I had, I because I had been a child actor, because I had started out so young and because I'd been in the business, I, I have scraped gum off theater seats with a razor. I have painted ceilings at four in the morning. I had done all these weird jobs in theater and film. And so by the time I started actually writing film, I knew what the challenges were. I, I've always been fascinated by the business of art, by the business of show. And so yeah. a lot of writers don't like the money and I actually love it. I find it fascinating as a creative challenge, right? There's a great, there's a, a scholar that does a lot of work on Shakespeare, the Shakespeare's sort of original acting troupe, who, uh, who I think his name is Gurley, who says, we forget that Shakespeare was a working actor in a repertory company that had to meet a budget. And so you could only produce certain number of characters that could be played because you only had so many bodies you could put on stage. You could only have so many scenes. The story had to be completed within a certain time. You had no overhead lighting. And so everything had to be done on this open stage at the globe, et cetera, et cetera. And so the technical constraints are the, they are the business. And I think we forget as artists, we think, oh, no, no, it's my imagination. It's my imagination. But that's not really true. Picasso once said, no, sorry, Da Vinci says that art thrives on constraint and dies from freedom. And I think Mm -hmm. the constraint of business is a really good education for young writers because you learn, oh, wait, if I write an 800,000 word novel, I cannot sell it. Or if I write a 1200 word (laughs) thing, it's not going to be a novel. So there's no way to print it and put it in Barnes and Noble. And so finding the, the lines of business and where the money goes has always informed the way I told a story and the kind of stories I could tell because I want an audience, right? I'm not one of those people that thinks like, I would write even if only frogs and fleas could read it. No, it's a business. Like I've got bills. Yeah. To pay. <laughs> so like part of this gig is the business of the art. Sure. Well, and, and you know, Picasso's thing was having the conviction to live off your art. So when you mm-hmm. think about him, like when he was younger, yeah, he was, he lived like an artist, but he also, when he was making a ton of money, he lived like an artist, right? Like right. his idea was, is like, I'm not gonna, I, my whole focus is gonna be on my work right. and that, that generate me an income. Now, if it's not, I gotta live that way. But his plan was never to be a poor, starving artist, right? If you look at how he lived in his later days. Absolutely. Well, it's funny. There's a, the story that I love about Picasso is at one point he was in a bar in Spain and he was doodling on a napkin and the, some man, a stranger, was sitting with him and knew who he was and said, can I have that napkin? And Picasso says, yes, that'll be $60 million. And the guy <laughs> said, but you just doodled it. You just doodled it. It took 20 minutes. And he said, no, it took me 58 years and 20 minutes. Like the 58 years are part of what I produced there. And I think we forget like every book we write teaches us more about what we've written and what we can write. Paula Vogel, who won the Pulitzer for How I Learned to Drive, used to say that your next play always teaches you how to fix your last play. And so whenever I'm stuck in a book, really what I'm always thinking is, how would I fix this in two years? Like in two years, what is the lesson I'll learn that will get me through this crisis? Because we do have to challenge ourselves and we do have to stretch and get better and bigger and all those other things. Or other ways we, you know, like, listen, you're either growing or you're dying. So I would much rather learn and grow. Well, and um, I think that that's a real hard concept for a lot of authors because how social media filters it for them. They think mm-hmm. people are doing so well or suddenly did well. And it's, I know for the clients that I'm working with that are mid six figures and up, like they have several million words under their belt. Right. right? And some of that stuff never you know, maybe it was published, but they pulled it down, right? Like, to your point, they used, that was all part of the on-the-job training. 
it's compost, yeah. right? That's part of the gig. But I also think, you know, people get obsessed with this idea that, you know, every word you write is precious. Every word you write, no, no, it, it's garbage. Like you actually want garbage. What we're looking for is happy, like happy accidents, right? Un unlikely miracles. And so part of being a writer is knowing that you can write a bunch of crap and then you throw it out and then you replace it with more crap. You're always elevating. There's no such thing as a perfect sentence, right? So you're always trying to elevate. I was at a conference, this is probably two years ago, and I will not name the conference, but I overheard an author say, oh, no, no, I've already published a book. I don't go to craft classes anymore. And what I thought was, well, then you're a failure and a moron because anyone who thinks that they are done learning is dead. Mm -hmm. There's no way around it. Like you can't survive in this business because the industry is different than it was 18 months ago. And so if you're not staying on top of, what's happening economically, what's happening politically, what's happening artistically, what's happening in the zeitgeist, just culturally, how are you gonna stay afloat? And so this idea that you can be sealed in aspic and then everybody else will just come and find you in your garret, that's nonsense. And there's, there's no universe in which that's a reality. There's a great book by Barbara Seaman called Lovely Me about Jacqueline Suzanne, where she talks about Jacqueline Suzanne, who, by the way, when she published Valley of the Dolls, was an out-of-work actress selling underwear on late-night television. She had had a lesbian affair with Ethel Merman during Call Me Madam, where she was an understudy. And she literally used her advance to buy copies of that book and then drove around the Northeast, like around Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, et cetera, and bought with those copies and signed them all because they couldn't be returned. So she invented herself as a bestseller so she didn't have to keep selling girdles at 11 o'clock at night, right? Mm. But that didn't magically happen. Like the publisher didn't like sprinkle fairy dust across her. She did the work. She got in a car and she drove around and she sold herself. Same thing with Margaret Mitchell. Same thing with Anne Rice. Like the people who become giant breakout bestsellers are bestsellers because they find a new reader, not because they find existing readers. Every bestseller in history has been created by a non-reading public picking up a book for the first time. Everyone. Vampire Lestat, Peyton Place, like you name it. Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Every one of those books was a book that where a group of people who had never read a book thought, sure, I'll try that. I'll put down Bubble Witch or Candy Crush or you know soap operas or whatever they're paying attention to. And they think, I'll invest 12 hours in this imaginary life. And that's a big ask. And so how can you, how can you create new readers? That's what I'm always thinking. Like, where is the new reader? And I love my fans and I want to serve my fans, but my job as an author, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, I've got to create new readers because if I don't create new readers, I'm never going to have continual success. Right? Well, and that's, I think the thing that a lot of folks forget is that, you know, there's new readers being created every day. Like yeah. the old the adage, not back in kind of when we were kids is the movies would come out every seven years. Right. right. And you had to go to see them in the movie theater then. And why was that? It's because they had done the study and knew that every seven years there was a new generation of human beings about the right age. Right. Their right. parents wanted to have that experience with their kids or their grandkids to take them to that movie. So they were you know, thinking through that whole process of like, okay, we have this intellectual property. How are we going to keep leveraging it and getting the most out of it? And not thinking that we've ever got all the readers, right? Like, right. Um, I'm just getting ready for the 20 books presentation and I was putting some data together again on Disney. And um, in 93, they made about $1.4 billion in operating income. Right. Last year, they made that just in merchandising. Doesn't surprise me at all. I'm obsessed right. with Disney. I mean, like, I've been obsessed with Disney since I was 10 years old. My mother weirdly did legal work for the company that handled their garbage processing. So every summer for about six years, my sister, my mother, and I went to the various Disney parks. At that time, it was Disneyland, Disney World. And we mm -hmm. would spend three months, and every day my mother would hand me a ticket, to all, like we had an e-ticket and a $20 mm -hmm. bill. And she'd be like, have fun. And so Disney was our babysitter. And when you spend that much time at Disney, like as a kid, you're like, yeah, amusement parks. But after about week two, you think actually Pirates of the Caribbean has really good air conditioning. <laughs> it's good for <laughs> noon. I'm serious. And so we knew like which rides had air conditioning and which rides were closest to the place you could get a lunch and like what food was cheap enough to make that $20 bill stretch. And so we sort of learned, I became obsessed with amusement parks. In fact, weirdly, when I, I graduated from high school at 16 and I wanted to become a theme park designer. That was my original goal. I was going to apply, you have to go to hotel management school and I was going to apply to hotel management school 
because I was so obsessed with the idea of shaping an experience, like mm. giving people an entertaining experience. And then I realized there are other ways you could do that, right? And so now here I am in entertainment. But the real impulse I had was this idea of building a world that people could, like an immersive world, right? Mm. And so I really think a lot of what we do as genre authors is create immersive worlds that are virtual. I mean, Aristotle mm. calls this mimesis, right? The reproduction of an action. And so that mimesis is a virtual world. It is a, a theme park of the mind. Right. Mm -hmm. And so as a creator of content, what you're always looking for is, am I giving them an emotional experience? Am I giving them an extraordinary value to couple with that experience? Because if you can do those two things, your fans will follow you off a cliff, but mm -hmm. very few people can give them those things. Right. And so everything, everything I grow towards, everything I work towards is, can I up my game? Can I up my game? Can I, can I deliver more every time? Because if I don't, there's, uh, this is actually something I get from film. There's always 50 other people over my shoulder waiting to take my spot, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I, this is something we kind of, you were, we talked about when we were in Florida and you just hit on it, is that emotional experience, right? Mm. Like, I think with authors, a lot of times they get, um, you know, the words are precious because that's their medium, but it's, it's not, that's not what the, the, the consumer is buying. That's not, yeah, they're a reader, but they're they're looking for an escape. They're looking for an emotional experience, right? They're looking for the internal experience. I mean, yeah. this, a lot of artists will get into this thing where they'll say, I need to express myself or my words are powerful or whatever. That's all kind of horseshit because unless you have an audience that is having an emotional reaction, you're not writing. What you're doing is masturbating with squiggles. And so like <laughs> until you actually produce something that generates a thought, I always compare it to an oyster, right? Like artists will say like, oh, my imagination. Fuck imagination. Everybody has imagination. The important imagination in entertainment is the reader's imagination, the audience mm. imagination. What an author can be is curious because if an author is curious, they find the facts that are necessary to excite a reader imagination. And so if you treat the audience as an oyster, right, and you have to put interesting grit into the, into the oyster, the pearl happens in their heads. That's what mm. the art is. That's why when you see an adaptation of, I mean, I, I've done a lot of adaptation work in film and television. The thing with adaptation is it's never going to be the book because the book happens in their head. There's no way to reproduce that. What you're looking to do is in a film or a television show to recreate the pearl in their head that you've never seen. Because until somebody can sort of stick a tube in their skull and suck out their associational cortex, instead what we're doing is kind of a reverie, right? We create these bits, we give the grit, we let the pearl happen. But I think that for people who are like expressing themselves in imagination, it feels personally empowering, right? You're getting to express all these things but it's also really self-indulgent because what you're saying is my feelings matter than my audience's feelings. There's a, a German critic named Gustav Freitag who wrote a book called Techniques of the Drama in 1879, and he is an Aristotelian, and I'm an Aristotelian. I love Aristotle. I love the poetics. If you've never read the poetics, go read the poetics. But Freitag said, listen, this is all well and good to talk about the, you know, the rise and fall of a dramatic line, but I don't care what the characters are feeling. I care about what the audience is feeling. And the shocking thing that Freitag said was, I want to mark, uh, the arc of a plot is not what characters are feeling. It's the bend of the audience emotion. And the characters are almost incidental to that. It's not the response of the character we care about. It's the response of the people in the audience. And, I, and yet, I think that people get caught up in this idea that no, 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 my characters are real people. Bullshit. They are squiggles on the page. We have no idea how tall Fitzwilliam Darcy is. We have no idea what color Willy Wonka's hair is. Like these are not real people. They're a device to, they're like a, a stick to crack the pinata, the open, uh, the pinata of the audience open and get the candy out. But I think people get seduced by their own, whatever, their own talent, their own genius, their own whatever, when it's the feelings. That's really, that's the treasure, right? That's the thing you want to get out of them. Well, let's, let's unpack that a little bit more. One of the things I hear a lot of authors talk about as well, you know, what audiences really want now is character-driven stories, not plot. How, how do you see that lining up where uh, authors are focusing more on their characters and how, how they can better trigger what you're talking about, how they can elicit those emotions in, a, in well, their audience? 
I'll tell you, I don't really believe in character-driven or plot-driven stories. I think what you have is you have stories. I think all stories are driven by action, right? And if you're talking about action that is internal, that's character-driven. If you're talking about action that is external, that's plot-driven. What you're really talking about is action, literally the process of creating change with intention. And so when people say they want character-driven stories, what they're wanting is a story that goes deeper as opposed to broader, right? And I go with that. I write character-driven stories. I love that. But that's because the actions I'm interested in are between people. But -hmm. that's not true in thriller. There are plenty of thrillers that are incredibly successful that are driven by cardboard cutout characters. But the Mm -hmm. plot is still a series of actions driven with intention in the external world. But I think what's happening in fiction is we are now inundated with product, right? I just heard a a statistic that there are 14,000 books in genre fiction produced every month. Every month. And so if you're going to rise... I think it's higher than that. I, if, if it is, even if it's higher, even worse, right? My, but, my data shows that there's 70,000 a month in ebooks yeah. coming out on Amazon alone. Wow. Uh, okay, that's horrifying. But so let's say 70,000 books. But the deal is, effectively, this is like the video footage you see of garbage islands in the middle of the ocean. Because in that p- floating pile of debris, like, what do you actually want to spend time with? What do you actually want to? And so as an author, what you're always looking for, what's going to bob to the surface? Where is the discoverability that allows people not just to see you, but to commit to you? The cost of the book is not the money. It's the time because anyone can pick up a free book now for 20 in 20 seconds. But if the book sucks, they've wasted the time and time is the one thing you can't get back. And so what I think what people are doing right now in, as successful authors is they're finding ways to guarantee ROI. You give me your eyeballs, I will give you feelings you're not going to get anywhere else. And up until relatively recently, there were gatekeepers, right? You had these sort of New York houses that had decided this is the way these, these products get in front of eyeballs. Well, that's gone now. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And the truth is everyone I know in traditional publishing, and that's a lot of people, are also producing independently because you can't produce enough content to get to the eyeballs. And the competition is shifting, right? The matrix is shifting around us every day, every week. um, I feel like some giant cataclysmic event happens in publishing. But the the way you distinguish yourself is by giving them, again, it's emotional experience and extraordinary value. What's the thing that you do that no one else can do? And so, and I think that's very hard for authors. I do a lot of marketing classes with people and I'll say remarkable books inspire remarks. So like what's remarkable, what's remarkable about your book, about your voice, about your humor, about your sexiness, like what is remarkable? And the truth is a lot of people are not remarkable and a lot of books are completely unremarkable and the more forgettable, I mean, it's like covering yourself in Vaseline and asking people to hold on to you, you will slip through. And so I think in those 70,000 books, right, in that pile of dreck that is coming out, how many of them change lives? How many of them get people through cancer? How many of them save people in shelters? Because those are the books that you want, right? And I'm not saying art, because I'll tell you, there are plenty of books that change lives that are not the best written books, but the stories are the most compelling. And so how do you find that? And I think it always comes down to action. That's why I have this book I wrote about, um, I a book I wrote about my sort of characterization and plotting technique called Verbalize, which is yeah, about yeah. this idea that genre is entirely driven by grammar. And I think because authors are afraid of grammar, they're always like, ah, that's scary. And I'm like, no, dude, the only way to write a book is with verbs. Like mm-hmm. verbs, action is what makes things connect. It's what makes things move in a sentence. Yeah, before we jump into that, I wanted mm. to add up. I think that while the gatekeepers have changed, right, mm-hmm. that you don't have the traditional gatekeepers, what is in place now is, and this gets to your point about how fast things change, is um, readers or people who watch a series, whatever it might be, people that are consuming content, they are prepared to go all in. A hundred percent. Right, like go deep and go hard. But what they are also going to do is they're going to make a decision about what they're going to go deep and hard on in a very short piece, right? So whether it's looking in a book that's in KU, right? Or if it's going on in Netflix and picking a series, you give it like five minutes, it's like, oh, if you don't give me something that engages, I'll just to the next thing because I think five minutes is generous. I don't think it's five <laughs> minutes. I think you know people talk about oh you know your first page. I think it's your first paragraph. I think I if a book bu- if a book does not get a hold of someone's eyeballs, like hook them like Velcro immediately, you're doomed. 
And my, you know, it's funny when I'm teaching, when I'm teaching writing classes, I always say the moment they can put your book down and I don't even mean while they are starting it. I mean, at any moment they can put your book down, you've lost them forever. You will live in a box under a bridge drinking Drano and your children will starve because the minute they think, eh, I'd rather go knit. I'd rather go masturbate. I'd rather go wash the dog. If they can put your book down, if your book doesn't feel life and death, they don't care. And so if you don't have them connected, you're, you're essentially giving them all these off ramps, all these opportunities to run away from your book. And that's scary, man, because there's a lot of demands on their attention. The way you anchor yourself, the way you anchor a career is saying to your fans, this needs to feel irrevocable, that like this book is so compelling. You do not want to go back to your life. You don't want to wake up from the dream that I've woven and it's going to hold you under. And so I always say like, it's like old school mermaids, right? Like beautiful creatures under the sea sucking you under. I want to hold them down and drown them in the dream because the minute they get back to the surface, I might lose them. And so I mm. never want to let that thread go. I never want them to have a moment where they snap out. And that's why I think craft is so critical. Not because I think everything has to be lit fit because PS, no, but it does have to be compelling and I think that's where you get down to solid craft. If you look at bestsellers, it is not always beautiful writing, but it is always beautiful emotion and action, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I kind of took you off. You were talking about- No, 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 no. I don't, I don't mind at all. Um, yeah, I was talking about actions, but I don't know that yeah. you want to talk about actions. We don't have to talk no, about- No, no, that's, I, I think that, because I've read the book, I think that it's, um, it's really interesting concept. And I, the, the part that I wanted to ask you about, since I've got you here, is mm. you've written that, and certainly you're thinking about it from the perspective of writing, right? And, and writing, uh, I know you've got a, you know, a great literary background, but what about the fact that, you know, audiences now are listening to books? How does action play into that? It is actually more important than any, I mean, it's actually, it changes not at all. The thing that's cool about working this way, I mean, the, the thing that's funny about that technique, about verbalizing, is that it works in every media. It works in film, it works in TV, it works in comics. I've used it in every media because I've been writing this way for 20 years. But what the thing with action is everything we follow with interest, everything that attracts our attention, everything that gives us emotional resonance is an action. There's no such thing as us being fascinated by someone just cause doing something. We want to know why. We want to fill in the gaps, right? There's a thing in comic books. If I show you two pictures, right? If I show you Clark Kent in a suit and then I show you the chest exposed in the big S, you think, ah, he's turning into Superman. But the truth is in comics, there's that strip between the two pictures that they call the gutter. Well, the, what happens between those two pictures is called closure. And the idea is the human mind looks at that picture and that picture and closes the gap between them. Well, that happens in all art. That's what happens in music. That's how movies work. You have a series of still images, but they're flicked past each other and we close the gap and create the illusion of motion. And I think what happens in, in are all... You familiar, are you familiar with uh, Daniel Kahneman? Daniel Kahneman. Do you, is there a title? He wrote... Um uh thinking fast and slow he's a phd and he's got a concept called um what you think is all there is yes 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 absolutely absolutely yeah, i didn't so, know the name but yes yeah, yeah so basically your you know your your system one brain just is going to fill in the you know you're going to you're going to put in what you want into the story but that's own. how we, we evolved that way. I mean, yeah. we're social oh, yeah. primates. We evolved to, to recognize patterns and to unpack patterns. And so yeah. action, I mean, you talk about audiobooks, you talk about comic books, you talk about translation, anything we do, the stories that always travel best country to country, culture to culture are heavy on action. And I don't mean mm -hmm. action like Biff Bam Pow, like tits and explosions. I mean, the things that are compelling because they are intentional and motivated by a goal, right? And so like when you write from a position of action as opposed to activity, right? I'm not just doing something cause I'm doing something in order to accomplish something else. Well, that's what you actually do with actors. Like that's why you say action to a group of actors. That's why we call actors actors because they have to pursue an action. Yeah. And so when I always think it's funny when I talked, I was just reading a, um, a book by a young writer and it's beautiful world building, beautiful descriptions, everything else but almost every verb in the entire book is to be. So the house is, the hero is, the heroine is, the monster is. 
And so it starts looking like one of those dioramas at Christmas, like a series of animatronic droids, because they never do anything. They just stand there being fascinating, but I can never connect to them because they're never actually acting with intention. And so mm. let's say you're listening to a book rather than reading a book, right? You're actually listening to an audiobook, et cetera, et cetera. What are you actually doing? You're using the spoken word to build a picture in your mind. Well, that's closure. And then in these imaginary characters that you've built in your mind, you're creating more closure because you're trying to determine their impetus, their goals, their actual objectives through the entire story. So again, it's sort of closure within closure within closure. You're creating a narrative in your mind. And actually, for some people, audiobooks are way more useful for that because they are you know, auditory learners. And I think that different storytelling styles lend themselves to different type of audience. In the same way, there are certain people who love graphic novels because what they love doing is actually the picture taking it apart. But all art happens in time. Everything, you know, it's, I had a music teacher at Columbia who used to say, what do you need to have music? And people would say, oh, oxygen or vibrations or ears or whatever. And he was like, no, you can imagine music. The only thing you have to have to have music is time. And so when I'm thinking about art, I'm always like, where does the time fall? Because you need time to look at a painting. You need time to watch a movie. You need time to, to, to read a book. Any of these things involve time spent artfully, right? Artifice. Yeah, and so right. I'm always thinking like, where does the time fall? And the reason action becomes so critical is it is time spent well, as opposed to time wasted. And I think that most of humanity is not spending its time well all the time, right? I mean, how many of us are going to slay dragons or marry a vampire king or bring down a corrupt mega corporation? No, but you can participate in genre fiction and you can feel those feelings. Keith Oatley is a psychiatrist who talks a lot about sort of theory of mind and psychiatry and the way it applies to fiction. He says, fiction is a way to experience dangerous emotions at a safe distance. And so a lot of, I think, what we're doing with storytelling is offering these crazy dangerous over the top situations in a safe context. No one gets on a roller coaster expecting their arms to be torn off or to lose their head, right? They buckle up, they ride the ride, they have the feelings, they get out, they're safe, but they've had the emotional experience. Well, that's what a book is. No one picks up your book and is reading it and thinks like, oh, I hope my penis isn't torn off. What they think is I'm going to read, it may be gross, whatever it is, I might get, but at the end, they climb out of the car, they, like they unbuckle the seatbelt, they climb out of the car, and they go find another ride, right? Yeah. And so I do think of it like a theme park, like we're providing these emotional landscapes that they get to navigate. And the character is just the cart that they ride to get through it. For sure, for sure. I, I think there's a lot of that where, you know, back to kind of that caveman stuff where that was how we were able to you know, make sure that we didn't lose half our tribe is explained to them. Right. I mean, that's why we survived, right? I mean, that's why it's us on the cockroaches because yeah. we figured out how to adapt because we're not the strongest, we're not the fastest, we're not we have the sharpest teeth or the best claws, but boy, are we clever. Boy, are we good at making up bullshit. And it's sort of like miracles of bullshit where we can invent entire worlds, but by doing that, we're able to plan for things that haven't happened yet. We're able to remember things that have happened in the past. And I think that too is, you know, uh, there's a great book about this, about books as a kind of artificial memory, that when you read a book, you're actually having false memories that don't belong to you, but you get mm. the advantage of learning from someone else's memories. And it's the miracle of literacy, right? That's the miracle of yeah. Gutenberg Press that, poof, I can now, I can live as a hobbit tracking a ring to Mordor, or I can live as a space marine bringing down an insect on Klindathu. Like, those are yeah. things live even though they never happen well and you think about um you know a lot of the authors that i know that are really successful now in genre fiction were really avid readers of right? course. they had a lot less to work with in those days what they were reading right um but just that little bit what was able to you know spark these imagination to create i think that right now we're in a golden age of content creation There's i agree so I many agree. minds that are working at coming up with all this new IP and then God knows how that's going to go the next layer, right? Because there are people reading their books and there'll be people that will then write from that from after being inspired by reading your book or, you know. Right. And it's, and in a way we also, because of technology, we've created an ability for fans to interact with a constructed world Tolkien calls these sub-creations, right? So the original world is the creation, but sub-creations are created by the created. And so 
these sort of worlds that we construct are now so immersive or so rich, so complex that people don't want to stop playing with the toys when the author is finished. That's what fan fiction is, right? I mean, that's what transmedia is. When we create a series of action figures or a video game or a lunchbox, we're actually saying, I know the story has sort of impregnated your mind, right? You're going to have a brain baby. But we want you to keep playing in the world that we built what you got. And so that, I think it encourages a certain amount of creativity in our readers. It's one of the things I love about, I write romance, and one of the things I love about the romance community is when I go to a convention, I have thousands of people. I can do market research on the fly. I can find out in the, like in the room, face to face, what is landing, what is not landing, what, what do they want, what do they not want, what do they wish existed that doesn't exist yet. And so it becomes this ongoing conversation because at any moment, You never know when the conversation you have is going to lead to a completely new world, a completely new series of games that you can play with them. And there is something game-like about all this, about the way, I I quote um, Jesse Schell all the time, who wrote The Art of Game Design, which is a great book I recommend. Um, But Jesse Schell talks about this, about the way you have to sort of continually produce new challenges for the players, because if you do not produce new challenges, they get bored. And we, we live in a culture that is a sort of, paranoid about boredom, terrified of boredom. If you look back at sort of letters from the 17th, 18th century, boredom was a lot of their lives. But at this point, if you let a teenager exist for five minutes without something to do, they're frantic because Mm. we're constantly feeding them entertainment. Now that's great for content creators. That's great for show business. What it's doing to the human consciousness, that's another conversation for another day. But I do think as content creators, we have an opportunity to enrich their inner worlds, right? To provide these rides they wouldn't have on their own. Mm. Well, I think what's interesting about that too is so when you think back uh, how, you know, you talked about Tolkien's book. I, I read it. I was talking to another author about this. But I, when my kids got to a certain age, I read in The Hobbit. And when I was little and I, I read it, it was an amazing book. It changed my life, right? And I'm reading it to them. I'm like, God damn, this is boring. Because it's a kid book. It's right, and it's just like it really goes on. And this other author mentioned, like, well, you know, you also have to think about when it was written. There was more of a need to kind of help people to imagine things because it wasn't like today. And we don't where, need that. We don't need right, that. Like, we know what that place looks like, and we can go watch this on YouTube, and we have all this visual effects that are in our mind that we can fill in, you know, the details with. Whereas. I think now that's what more I'm looking for in a book is I, I don't need somebody to tell me what they were imagining. I need you to set up for what I want to imagine. Because right? you want to create closure, right? Yeah. This is closure again. There's a, there's a, um, I think it's Marshall McLuhan talks about Gutenberg. He says the one thing everyone forgets about the printing press is that the moment the printing press happened, memories started to mutate because the minute we could write something down and pass it to new people, they don't have to remember anything. And Mm. up until a certain point in history, I mean, again, we forget, but up until a certain point in history, everything we knew about astronomy, about medicine, about chemistry was written in verse because it could be memorized. We Mm. forget Homer memorized the Iliad and the, I mean, that was a memorized text that was not written down somewhere. People who could remember hundreds of thousands of words and spit them out verbatim. We don't have that ability anymore because it was killed by the book. The book eliminated that kind of knowing. Now, it gave us the ability to do other things, right? We can have other sort of cultural expansions as a result. But as a, because we suddenly gained the ability to trap memory, to cage memory, and then hand it off to someone else, it means we've sort of crippled that function. We do have the ability to do it. We just don't do it very much anymore. And if you look up ours memorial online, you'll see there's still competitions where people will go and like memorize a phone book or memorize the entire New Testament. But do we need that anymore? And if we're not going to do that, if we've gone, we've said, okay, fine, printing press, great. What do we do now that we're at a point where a book doesn't only have to turn one way or the other, where you go forward into the future, back into the past, because now we actually have network texts. Does that change what art is? Does that change what entertainment is? And there's been all this debate in the game community about how much agency do we allow the user to have? If you can allow a user to affect a narrative storyline, is it still a book? Is it something else? Is there a convergence where what film is, what video games are, what comics are, what books are become one thing? Who knows, right? We're probably too old. I mean, you and I are probably too old to understand that. Frankly, our grandkids are probably not going to get there. 
but in 100 years, 150 years, possibly, because I think we do have the capacity. I mean, humans are so flexible. We have the capacity to do amazing things. We're also ineffably lazy, <laughs> right? And so, and so whatever is the lowest common denominator, whatever takes the least effort is the thing we're going to do. And that's why yeah. people play, you know, apps on their phone where all they have to do is watch advertising to play for free because we're lazy. We're lazy and we're cheap. And so as content creators, what do we do to get those eyeballs on us, to prove to them that we are worth the time that they invest in us? And how do we continue pushing ourselves so that every new story takes us to a new world, a new space, a new opportunity for closure? Mm -hmm. Well, to that point, I think the question I was kind of had for you was, and you kind of set me up for it really well, is like with this new world, what is it that you're thinking about as a content creator? Oh, good um, question. Like what, what do you need to be prepared for in all these new waves that are coming at you? Like how are you making sure that your business is going to be relevant? Well, the, the first thing is I think, you know, I come in with a weird skill set because I came from like media. I mean, I came from show business. And so when I came into fiction, I just assumed that entertainment was entertainment and books were just a different part of show business. And most people in publishing treated it as if it was sort of siloed. It was somewhere over on the side and, you know, film and television and comics, like that's over there with pop culture, but we over here are literary. And I think that's chazrai. I think that's nonsense because we are entertainment and we are in the business of entertaining people and we are um, in the business of creating emotional content, right? But in terms of looking forward, what I'm always thinking is, what don't I know and how can I be flexible enough to adapt nimbly for it? Because I do think it's super easy, especially as we get older, to think like, eh, the youngins will do it. Eh, who really cares? And if you look back at the history of eBooks in the 2000s, right, in the aughts, from about 2002 to about 2010, you can watch every major publisher drop the ball. You can watch them. And it's the weirdest thing if you look back at all these opportunities where market dominance and untold billions could have rained down upon them if they had been nimble enough to say, hey, here's an opportunity. The production costs are really low. If we embrace this, we can do this, that, the other. And the only content creator that saw that is the content creator that publicized it, and that would be Amazon. And you want to know how powerful that could have made all those other people? Look at Amazon. Here we are, right? And Amazon doesn't even think of itself as a book company anymore. And so no. for me, as a creator, what I'm always thinking is, how do I, I don't want to say future-proof because it implies I want to ward the future off, but how can I keep myself tuned up at all times so that I can think, how does my IP get leveraged? How do I extend the value of this world I've built? How do I find, like I'm a big believer in transmedia. How do I find ways to leverage this story, this character, this world that I've created in a new format for a new audience in another language so that there's always an expanding pool of access because not everyone finds your book in the same way. If there's one thing I've learned in romance, it's that the reader who buys my book in hardcover is not the reader who buys my book in trade, which is not the reader mm -hmm. that buys me in paperback or in audio or in comics or in manga yeah. or in video games, all different readers. And there may be overlap, like the Venn diagram definitely has overlap, but the truth is, if I'm not able to access all those different pools, I'm leaving money on the table. Yeah. Worse than that, I'm leaving eyeballs on the table because I, don't, I know that that reader may not find me the next time. If I'm so fortunate as to have that reader pay attention to me for one second, why would I waste the opportunity? And so as, yeah. as a creator, I'm always thinking, how do I stay ready? How do I keep flexible? It's like yoga, for, <laughs> yoga for the artist. How do I keep stretching and binding myself so that I'm nimble enough to get there mm. well i think audio is a perfect example of that right now is um you know it's growing so fast mm. and it's not cannibalizing reading sales and it's because no. those people were never readers right like everybody right, I right, talk right. To them, oh i love audiobooks but they don't read they they're listening to audiobooks while they commute while they walk their dog like absolutely myself um you know, especially with nonfiction, now that I can listen to a book and I can listen to it at one and a half times speed, like I'm burning through content, right? Right, like, right. So that's, to, to your point is like, I don't think, we, we forget that kind of stuff is happening out there with our readers or like, right. or, or our audience, let's just call them that, right? It's like, oh, there's these people out there that they, they are geeky and they are into steampunk, but they just don't read, but if they could listen to it, 
they would buy and they and guess Absolutely. what? They have to buy the book, right? Like they'll they'll spend twenty five bucks for an audio book, right? But we go back to that silo mentality, this idea that like books are over here in this discreet phone booth and only if you're willing to put a quarter in that phone booth do you get that. I remember reading, or this is early, early on when I was first starting in fiction, the idea that the largest bestseller in the world, the books that break out in ways that we can never imagine, um, that no author dreams of happening because it's so pie in the sky impossible, still sell about one one hundredth of what television and film do because it is easier to look at a piece of moving video than it is to read a book. And so when we think about them as separate things, what we're saying automatically is, okay, I'm going to stay over here siloed where the, the pickings are smaller, like the money is smaller and there's a smaller audience, but it's easier entry, right? When I first, I, I was not a skier. I grew up in Texas and I was a showbiz kid. So I never got to ski because Show season is when you go skiing. Well, when I finally got an opportunity to ski, I discovered that snowboarding and skiing were like converse opposites, right? It's very easy to ski quickly. It's very hard to become, uh, it's very hard to become a master. Snowboarding is the exact opposite. It's very, very hard to get started. But once you get started, you become a master very quickly. And I feel like in fiction, everyone is sort of opting for the ski model. They're saying, okay, I can get up to speed, I can get a book out, I can put something in the market, and I can get eyeballs on me. And I think, great, how many eyeballs? 20,000, 100,000, half a million? That's a really small audience. And I mean, globally, that's such a small audience it almost doesn't measure in terms of the number of beings on the earth that could look at your work. What's ironic is, I think that the, it, I don't want to say the fear of success, that sounds pop psyche, but the fear of scrutiny or the fear of oversight or the fear of change mm -hmm. creates this, this intransigence, this willingness for authors to say, well, but I know how to do this. Well, I can just set this up on, well, I know that if I stick with Amazon, I can. And you see this right now. It's happened, it happened with Kindle Worlds. As soon as they axed that, all these people were like, golly, gee willikers, I can't believe that happened. But if you look at KU, there are all these people in KU that are making six and seven figures a year that are panicked because of what they see is the piling on of Drek and the cratering of their numbers. And what happens when Amazon decides, eh, not worth it? What happens to that economy? Where do all those mm -hmm. authors go? And so do they have a backlist? Is there a way for them to take the 75,000 books that they published on Kindle Unlimited in the last 10 minutes and put that on a shelf somewhere? Is that the same kind of book that sits on the shelf at Barnes & Noble? And I would argue, no, it's not. That's not that it's not a book. It's a different kind of book with a different kind of audience. And so mm -hmm. if we continue to silo ourselves in these weird, discreet communities where we feel like king of our anthill, we're never going to get anywhere because we're constantly figuring out how to be king of the anthill. And we're mm -hmm. never climbing anything bigger. The danger is, of course, the minute we start trying to climb something bigger, we're saying, all right, I'm going to go duke it out. I want to have 100 million readers. I want to have those. And how do you get to that? And I don't mean J.K. Rowling, Stephen King. I mean, how does the average author leverage what they can produce and what the audience is and get from 10,000, 50,000, 150,000 readers to hundreds of millions? And I think that's a really giant leap for most people because of what reading is in our culture, because of what we mm. think reading is. Um, and I think that audio helps bridge that. I think that comics help bridge that. I think television adaptations bridge that. Netflix has changed the game. The average mm. Netflix viewer is a reader. The average Hallmark viewer is not a reader. And so a lot of mm. television adaptations of books are worthless for authors. But if you look at the markets in television and film where they are readers, there's opportunity there. But of course, very, very few people working in genre fiction work in film and television. And so there's like a disconnect. No one is actually making, making those links or, or having those conversations because they're seen as a siloed, separate world. Yeah, you know, so I have this kind of, way of thinking about that i um i call it the, the reader writer relationship mm -hmm. right and it's, um are you familiar with the term keystone mutualism no so that so it's symbiotic relationship you're familiar with that right of course so right like the anemone and the clownfish is the, the, the typical one well a keystone mutual uh mutualism is a symbiotic relationship that's so important the whole ecosystem is built around it the most common one is is uh, pollinating insects, so honeybees and plants, right? Right, like, right, right. That relationship fails, the whole, the whole... The entire earth starves to death and dies, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> oh, that so, old thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
so in my when I think about it, like that's got to be a fundamental principle you think about because the ecosystems, those biomes are Amazon, traditional publishing, whatever comes in the future. The, the keystone mutualism is your relationship with your readers because right. that's where all the money comes from. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. All the money to pay for all our conferences, it's paying for your mortgage and mine, that all comes from some reader that's prepared to exchange that for an emotional experience. Actually, I'll go further. Not even the reader who's willing for the emotional experience, the reader who's willing to share with another reader that they must go read it, right? It's not just that they are willing to read it, it's that they're willing to be boots on the ground like soldiers in your army to go do the deed. Because what a lot of people think is, oh, I have my readers, they are done. No, what you need is readers who are so excited they can do the selling for you. Because selling your own books is a ticket to ruination. Books cannot be sold. They can only be bought. And so you need other people to go out and do that work or otherwise you're the schmuck that won't shut up on Instagram. Right. And I, you know, people are always like, how do they do it? Because I've got clients that don't do any advertising at all. It's like, well, are you prepared to go to a convention every weekend? Right. Because that's what they, they were going to do that anyhow. Right. <laughs> they were going to be there dressed up in their costume no matter what. Right. But they're they're making that relationship a one on one relationship, and those fans go start fan clubs, and those fan clubs start fan clubs, and that's it. That, and they're like, well, how did they do it? Like, it took a long time, but that's how it happened. Well, the myth of overnight success is so toxic. I'm always sort right. of hammering on this this idea that magically Joe Conrad or anybody J.K. Rowling that there was a moment when poof everything suddenly got easy. In New York City, there's this old truism, which has worked for 20 years, overnight success, is that just because something else happened off stage and you didn't see it, doesn't mean it didn't happen. Lana Turner used to say, never mistake someone else's highlight reel for the whole movie. And I think what a lot, a lot of what happens in publishing is you have this very large population of people that are like, quick money, easy, I can type. And because the tools of writing exist in everyone's home, because we all have computers, everyone's like, typing is writing. And you and I both know that typing and writing are two different things. And so mm -hmm. the minute those typists decide, I'm going to type a book, they're not creating books. What they're creating is flotsam and jetsam in the ocean. Like the ecosystem is being crowded out by all of this dross. And that's part of the modern challenge is how do we get past the dross? The truth is the readers spot bullshit at 20 paces, right? Audiences, that's true in film and television. They yeah, and I, you know, I, when I was at um, Mink, I heard authors that were complaining about, oh, it's, there's all this shit that's on Amazon. It's like that stuff goes to the, bar the virtual bargain basement in hours. Right, like, yeah. There's, right, like there's. But those read those those readers are a different reader, right? Those customers are a different customer. I just did um actually sort of a bridge building thing because I don't know I'm not I mean my publisher sometimes puts some of my stuff in KU but I am not in KU it's just not my world. But I did an anthology with a group of KU authors and one of the things I discovered is they think about sales completely differently than I do. They think about pre orders completely differently than I do. What they think of as good pre order numbers is very very different from what I think of as good pre order numbers because they're not selling books, they're selling clicks. And so the idea that someone buys your book and has a copy and puts it on a shelf, or buys your book, has it as an ebook and puts it on their Kindle, is not how they operate. Because they think of it almost as like a temporary thing. It's, it's more like a piece of tissue that you grab out of a box as you go by and you use it and you discard it. And that's not saying it's a bad book or, a, or, or not a book, it's that it's not the same kind of book and it's not the same reader. The KU reader is not the same person that is waiting at midnight when the book drops, right, at a mall. That's a different person. And so finding out how to navigate that is, I think, a huge part of what we have to do as professionals. We just have to see, like, where we fit in the ecosystem and we have to get in where we fit in because not mm -hmm. every author is going to be Thomas Pynchon. Not every author is going to be Margaret Atwood. But also not every author is going to be Nora Roberts or Stephen King. Like, where do you fit in the rainforest of genre publishing? Yeah. And I think that's harsh because you look at the ecosystem and you think, oh, wait, I'm not a leopard. I'm more of a sloth. <laughs> I'm more of a slime mold at the base of the tree. And where do you want to go to? Where, do you, where is the evolutionary potential? And overnight success is an easy way to say, like, that's okay, honey. One day you'll be J.K. Rowling. Sure, Harry Potter's coming for you that's like a band-aid for wounded hope. Yeah. No, thanks. No, yeah, thanks. Also, there's been some big changes that have happened, right? So you, just in the time that I've kind of been around this community is 
you take something like military science fiction. Mm -hmm. right? So you could go in, people that were reading that, they'd read everything. Mm -hmm. there, was, they were, there was no books. And when anything came out that had at least the feel of that, they were all over it. Well, then new authors have come in and they've built their own world. They've built a series of books. That, and like, so now if I'm a reader of that, I've got five or six authors that I could read for, for months, right? So if you're a new author coming into that, you have, to, you have to establish yourself, find those readers, and then you have to build that world to compete with that market. Not that it's a competitive space, but like in you're the reader. It's an ecosystem. You're navigating right. an ecosystem. Yeah. And I mean, I, you can argue that some of these folks that have built these massive worlds that have multiple, you know, book lines in them, they're competing with themselves, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that for, for a new author coming in, um, it is a, a different game. But if you stick to the main principle of going and finding your readers. Always. Right? Always. It'll take time. But the, the, advice, the advice I give to every baby author when they come in and they say, well, how did you do it? And I always tell them, I'm the worst example because I came from show business. I had a bunch of weird skills that came out of 30 years in the industry, I, sales and all the other stuff. But the, if you, there's literally, um, there's a guy named Anatole Rappaport who was a mathematician. There's a book about this actually called The Evolution of Cooperation. But Anatole Rappaport back in 1980 wrote a program called Tit for Tat. And it was part of a gaming consortium. Do you know this story? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he tit for tat. The, it had two rules, cooperate and reciprocate. And the way it worked was, if you were nice to it, it was nice back. And if you were an asshole, it was an asshole back until you were nice again, and then it was nice again. And by cooperating and reciprocating, this program, it was only four lines long, it destroyed the competition. They had a rematch three years later, and they actually made it twice, for, made it kind for two rounds. And so it would cooperate, cooperate, and then reciprocate, right? And it actually was even more successful. And so my thing I always say to baby authors is cooperate and reciprocate. Be kind to people. Find people that know what they're doing. Get better. Reciprocate. Mm -hmm. When people are hostile, don't hang out with them. When people are yeah. jerks, don't hang out with them. Do the work. Get move forward. The problem is for people that want a quick fix, for people that want like an easy shortcut, that's anathema because I'm saying to them, hey, this is a career that might take you 40 years to get there. And what people want is a career that will take them 40 minutes and they want millions in the bank and they don't want to have to think about readers. That's not really writing. That's really more kind of a hustle. And there's no shame in being a grifter. Like if you're a grifter, be a grifter. But don't pretend that you're being something other than a grifter. And I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of what we see in publishing is people standing there saying like, no, no, my art while they're busy picking people's pockets. And that's not writing, that's something else. And I'm all for it, like noble thieves, great. Go and steal from people if that's what gives your mojo, mojo. But for me, I wanna be a working professional. I've been working in entertainment for 30 years. I don't wanna steal. I actually think the most, the most glorious job in the world is being paid to make up bullshit and people give me money because I am really good at dreaming for them. That's awesome. And so I, whenever I'm challenged, when people say like, well, what do I do? What can I say? I always say your default should be thank you. Thank you, universe, for letting me do this crazy job. Thank you for giving me money and giving me your eyeballs. That is such a great gift. And it's the gratitude is the thing that sort of keeps me, when things get grim, right? I can think like, yeah. I am so fortunate to live right now at this moment in publishing. It's thrilling. It's thrilling. It's a, sh a shocking, exhilarating time to be an artist but only if you cooperate and reciprocate. Because if you're an asshole, the universe will take you down. I mean, and now, the way social media works, everything else, oh, yeah. it's, it's swift and brutal. Swift, yeah. brutal, and realistic, the takedowns, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we've seen it in the industry and in other industries, right? Like, so um, you do have to make sure you're keeping your side of the you know, street clean. And, yeah. and I think the other part of that, too, is, is like, um, you know, I've been in a lot of different industries and this is the first time where I've really experienced kind of that high school bathroom gossipy mentality yes. that gets like this has nothing to do with business, right? Like this is not going to make anybody any money, um, but it's a real part of this industry. Because a lot of these people don't understand what business is. And yeah. I say that without judgment, but 
a lot of people, again, this goes back to this idea of like, I'm an artist and I just want to express and I'm going to sit in my garret and I'm going to publish my book by throwing pages out the window. If you're a business person and you behave professionally, other people will treat you professionally. What I find shocking is people that don't behave professionally, that act like complete jerks or complete idiots. And then they're shocked when other jerks and idiots are, are drawn to them, right? Like moths <laughs> towards flame. All the jerks and idiots are like, aha, another jerk or idiot. I can go be with them. But the truth is professionals seek out other professionals. A-gamers right. always seek out other A-gamers. And so finding the way, finding the path to a successful, positive, cooperative, reciprocal career, that's long game, baby. Like my feeling is if you're going to work in entertainment, you cannot think of the buck you're going to make in a year. You've got to think of what they're going to write your obituary about. You have to be thinking 50 years out because that's really the map of a career. The idea of like quick fix, instant money, the idea that magically, I mean, hope is not a strategy. You can't pretend that Stephen King's career will be yours. Stephen King couldn't have Stephen King's career now because times have changed. Horror has changed. Everything about publishing has changed. And he talks about that, about the way that the, the industry has shifted in the last 50 years. And so this magic bullet fantasy that people use to touch their no-nos in the dark when they need to make a car payment is, at, I think it's, it, um, it's corrosive. I think it eats away at the real kind of diligence and vigilance and, and rigor that you have to approach a career with. Mm. Well, what I would add to that is this, is I think right now um, the opportunity for somebody to to get big and to get into other spaces is, is, is a higher probability than ever. Because I know authors that are being approached by Amazon Prime to have their books turned into movies. Sure. Uh, sure. Happening. But the part you have to understand about that, when they show up at your door and knock, these aren't jackasses. These are guys with a mission. That's it. That are running a multi-million dollar business. And like if you're, you know, you're, you're, you don't have your copyrights registered and your IP portfolio is like a yellow notebook, they're just going to be like, we will be right back. And right. they're going to go find one of the other 10 guys that write stuff just like you. Well, and it's funny, I was just talking about this. Um, I was in Columbus this last weekend for the, the Columbus RWA chapter, Romance Writers of America chapter. And, um, it came up. I, something I actually say a lot when I'm t doing a marketing class is I'll say, okay, raise your hands. Who would like to go on The Tonight Show tonight at 11 p.m.? Who would like to go on The Tonight Show and talk about their book for eight minutes? And of course, everyone raises their hand. Yes, yes, I would love to go on The Tonight Show. And then I would say, great. So you're media trained and you obviously have your wardrobe and your makeup and you have someone handling your hair and you have someone that will actually get, you know how to get out of a bad situation if you're with an interviewer that doesn't know what they're talking about or is hostile or is negative or brings up part of your past. And I'll say to them, are you ready? Are you really ready? Are you ready right now to have this success that you think you deserve? And the truth is most people don't mm. plan for the success that they want. And so like if you plan to be this amazing success, what are you doing to get ready for it? Because luck is opportunity plus preparation. And if you aren't actually doing the prep, you're just hoping that lightning will strike. And listen, you can wrap yourself in tinfoil and copper wire and stand on a church roof and pray, but hope is not a strategy. And so if I do want to be on The Tonight Show, if I do want to go and have a conversation with Andy Cohen on Watch What Happens Live, I've got to be ready for that. I have to be trained. I have to have, I have, to have a book that backs that up. I need the book that they, when I go on The Tonight Show or on Andy Cohen, I need to be able to say, this book is the one book I can use to gain a new audience of 100,000 people. 100,000 new sets of eyeballs because of this book. That's a lot of if, that's a lot of maybe. And that kind of subjunctive planning is hard. And I think that, again, it's something that authors avoid because holding yourself accountable is scary. Putting oh, yeah. yourself under the microscope and saying like, well, that kind of sucks. Well, my website's kind of crappy. Right now, I'm actually doing a website overhaul because my website's out of date and I know it is and I am a marketing freak. So I look at it and I feel like, I feel like I'm looking at dirty underpants every time yeah. I look at it. The truth is, it's perfectly serviceable, but I also know what it should be doing that it's not doing, but that's on me, right? I've got so many balls in the air right now, I haven't had time to sit down and do the work that's necessary to make that happen. But I know that I need to make that work happen. I'm not sort of thinking there's someone else to blame. It's on me. The one thing about being an entrepreneur, like being a small business owner, it's all you. Whenever people say, oh, I'm going to self-publish and then all my problems are over and no more rejection, I'm like, oh, no, because the book that you self-publish is the one that New York should be begging you for. The book yeah. that you want to self-publish should be the one that's so perfect, people are trying to give you millions of dollars to make it into a film. Because if it's not, 
Why are you self-publishing it? It's not like self-publishing it is going to make it better. If anything, self-publishing it, you're guaranteeing that it's less likely to be noticed. And so whatever you're putting forward has to be your best, man. You shouldn't be giving them the weak work. You should be giving them your children. <laughs> you should be sacrificing the firstborn. Got to get them to Glen Gary lead. Yes. Yes, exactly. You have to, you have to close the gap. And what is it? Like you want to think of it this way. You want to minimize the friction between what you need them to do and what they want to do. You have to mm. minimize that friction. And right now, I think a lot of authors are like, well, I wrote the book and it's done and someone else will handle that and someone else will think of this and someone else will tell me where to go and where to stand and where to sit. There's 50 million other people perfectly willing to do all that work if you're not. And as I used to say to actors, if there's another job you can do, please go do it because there's plenty of us, right? And I'm not saying that to be hateful because if you want to do it, great, do the work. But it's a job that you choose. It's not like someone holds a gun at your head and says, you will write a genre novel or I will kill you and all your children. No, you picked it. And so if, yeah. you, if you choose to be a writer, keep on choosing to be a writer. Don't decide I'm going to be a writer, but for right now I'm going to sit on the couch and eat guacamole and play angry birds. Like you have mm. to do the thing that you are. You have to be the thing you are. Well, action, with, action. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's part of that whole thing that, you know, I think that folks get themselves when they decide, when they see self-publishing as an opportunity, right? Because it does open a lot of doors. Of course. But what, but what it does do is it says, okay, there's that self part. Like that's the first part of the word is self. You have to do all of these things that a publisher would do, right? Publishers had to do this stuff to, to sell a product. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like they were just figuring out how to ways to pad their expense account. It was like, these were the things they figured out needed to be done to sell books. Those things haven't really changed. No, they but just, the trouble is that when, you know, it's funny, when Self-Pub first broke out, there was so little content available for EPUB that you could throw things up and they would sure. sell. And there was a window of about six months. And we still see people that sit at a certain point in the pyramid because of getting in early and often, Right. I always tell people about Milton Burl. Milton Burl was a vaudeville performer who, because he did not book a lot of gigs, was willing to do television when it first launched. Every, everyone thought television was a, a shit show. No one wanted to do TV shows. And by a fluke of technology and entertainment history, television took off. And Uncle Milty was the person who had been on so many shows, he became a star. Not because he was a big star in vaudeville, but because he was so desperate, he was willing to do it. And so like, <laughs> there are people who got in early, and that is great. But those people will also say to you, that can never happen again. Like that right. door has shut, and so what are you gonna do? If there's an author coming into the industry in 2019 and they think that it still works the way it did in 2017, let alone 20, 2002 or, or, or 2011, those years, the intervening years have been brutal, have been cataclysmic, and the way that they've churned the field is, is um, sobering, let's just say. Mm. I mean, like we have watched entire companies rise and fall like empires under the Romans. And to, to believe that you can sort of navigate that on whims and hope and laissez-faire is pretty foolish. And I, I always tell people, like I have friends that self-publish and are passionate about it and they love it. They are some of the most diligent, hardworking professionals I've ever met in my life because what they're doing is they're saying, I write books and then for fun over here in my other, my second job, I'm a full-time publisher for this entity who's writing the books. Those are two different jobs with two different people that happen to occupy the same body. That's crazy. And I'm not saying it's not possible, but it means that if you're going to do it, you have to be willing to work two jobs. You have to be willing to give your full investment. And there is money to be made, and there are stars that break out. And right now, New York is panicked. At RWA, at Romance Writers of America, this past July, New York houses were wandering around in the halls asking independent published people how they were advertising, where they were spending their money, what the marketing campaigns were doing. They were asking the indies how they were doing these things. And that tells me that New York is curious. New York is panicked. New York is unclear. But I think it's because we're in a giant time of social upheaval. I also think the sociopolitical climate right now is making everyone feel hostile, nervous, and desperate, which does not help anything. And so you add that to the basic issues of, I have bills to pay, I have books to write, I have things that have to go out. 
And I think people get nutty. I think that's, I think that's why we see this weird aggression online. I think it's why we see people kind of coming for each other. And you see this in subgenres where in mystery or in sci-fi or in historical romance, you'll see people kind of duking it out. And I think we're at a time of fractious division, right? Yeah. And so people are trying to find a way to make a space and pay their bills and not get killed. For sure. And well, you know, one of the things that uh, I've been talking about in my newsletter and uh, I spoke a little bit about it at Mink was um, a lot of folks don't look at what their biggest business partners do. Right, right. right? But like Amazon's been very clear since 2016 that they're going to increase their revenues from advertising. Right. I mean, it's right there in their, 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 their earning statement, right? They don't make money selling stuff. They don't. If you look at the numbers, they're they losing never money. did. All never they did. were doing. No, the, if, you look at, if you actually look at Bezos, if you look at what Bezos has been saying for 25 years, you can actually watch him build the, the, the behemoth that is before us, right? Every step of the way, he's been building this. And he says right up front in that, in the, that business biography he put it back in, I think it was 2002, he said the only reason he picked books is because they were flat and they didn't require refrigeration. We mm. didn't care about the books. They were just an easy widget to sell for an, for an economics guy. And so- yeah. When people, it's, I call it the college um, rec room problem, which is when you're in college and you go to the rec room, you're like, I need more chairs. Call maintenance. Someone get chairs in here. And then when you're done, you don't put the chairs away because someone from maintenance will take care of that. But in the real world, there is a crew of people that must provide the chairs. They have to buy the chairs. They have to maintain the chairs. They have to clean up the vomit and the whatever else from the chairs. And they have to take the chairs away. But if you live like a child, you expect, you know, mumsy and dadums to come and take the chair and bring the chair and leave the chair. And I think that some people treat Amazon like a college rec room. They think that Amazon owes them something or that Amazon is somehow a neutral field. Amazon's a business. They're not here to help you or to build your career. And for whatever highfalutin goals they put out to make sure that creators are going to come and provide for them. And I have, please let me be clear, I have full respect for Amazon. But Amazon is in the business of making money, and they have no interest in supporting your ego or your, your, like your family's need for recognition or anything else. They want to make money. And if they can mutually exploit you, mazel tov. And the moment you are no longer useful, sayonara. Because there's nothing that says they owe you anything. No one owes anybody an artistic career. Joe Orton, um, a playwright of the 1960s who was murdered horribly by his lover, Joe Orton used to say that being an artist is not a disability. And if you look at publishing right now, there's a lot of people <laughs> that treat being an artist, being an author, as if it's somehow, as, as if they've been confined to a wheelchair, as if they've had their sight taken away, as if everyone needs to stop and help them do whatever they're doing. But it's not a disability. It's a job. And you choose the job. And so you can choose to not do the job. But treating it like a disability encourages everyone to spend a lot of time whining and waiting instead of doing the work. And I do think that there is something to be said for doing the work. And I also think sometimes it sucks. And sometimes you are going to whine and you are going to have to wait, but do it somewhere that is not in public view. Because what the, what the readers, what the audience does not want is to think like, God, what an asshole. I don't need to know that. Because you're part of the dream factory. You're part of the people selling them this fantasy. Yeah. Emotions, right? Emotions. Yeah. They don't want to hear about your heavy period or about the closed head injury you almost gave yourself. <laughs> That's not the thing they're buying from you. No. Well, I'm, you know, um, with this whole recent deal with, with Amazon and everyone who was, again, they were able to be successful. You know, like you said, there was that first phase that may have done it because there was no content for the fact. Volume, just, sure. Right? Then you had some people that were pretty good advertisers, right? And now it's like, well, my advertising isn't working. Right. Well, because well, the advertising has changed, right? I mean, even yeah. month, month, the metrics are changing. The way the advertising lays out is changing. Even the way that the search engine works. In the last year, that search engine has changed three times. And so, yeah. we again, back to nimbleness, right? Staying on top of it. That's part of the gig. It's part of the you gig. You understand what your business partner is trying to do, right? And it's like, and then you make a decision what you're going to do. Do you want to try and continue to advertise like you did? Mm -hmm. Understanding that now there's, Madison Avenue advertising firm running ads in the same space on your page. Competing, right. competing right. with independents. Absolutely. Because right. the, the independents who got in early are now duking it out with the very people that they left, the people that they were trying to get away from. Yes. And also when you think about like um, 
on a particular ad space, you know, you're thinking, you know, I know some people are spending 40, 50,000 bucks a month on advertising and people are like, holy cow. It's like, okay, that's a big deal. But when a guy from Amazon calls on Saatchi and Saatchi and they say, hey, we can do this for you if you advertise Procter & Gamble account yes. on us. And they're like, I'll peel off a half a million bucks for you. Let me tell you something. I know and people. They bulk, they're going to pay them 10 million. Of course they are. I know people that are paying three to five, single authors paying three to $500,000 a year to stay on the lists because their real income comes not from book sales, not from the clicks on KU, but from the bonuses. Because Amazon has set up an ecosystem where all we're doing is producing high volume turnover for people in KU. And the high volume doesn't pay for itself. The high volume pays for the advertising to keep you on the list so that you can get the bonus. So they might clear $800,000 a year, but they net 80 because all of the money is going to cover shoots and design and marketing and advertising on Amazon. They are t so again, this is a, it's a business, it's a business, right? It's not, there are parts, there are parts of the business that are maybe not glorious to look at. How the sausage gets made is always ugly. Mm. And I think that we forget that as the competition has gotten stiffer, as the market has gotten more crowded, as Amazon has gotten more ruthless about their margins, there's a less, there's less wiggle room. There's less, there's less error allowed to a small business owner like an author who wants to produce content. The people who were producing or able to produce, let's say, 10 books a year, eight books a year, whatever it was, 10 years ago were crazy. Now, that's nothing. We have, there's an issue. I was talking to Joanna Penn about this, that you know, AI is coming, that China Lit has developed software that can produce a genre novel in 22 minutes. Last year, they contracted 1,100 Americans to come in and file the AI flashing off of the books. So they sounded like they were written by humans. What do you do with a company that can produce a book that competes with you in 22 minutes? You can never compete. So what does that do to the KU ecosystem? Is it possible to maintain an ecosystem when you have a thousand books a day dropping in from a machine? Is Amazon willing to cut a check to a company that is not a person, but is literally a bank of AI accounts? Is that still a book? Are those people that are the audience, are they still readers? What does that do to literacy? Like what does that do to genre? Are the people who participate in that, the, the work for hire people, and they have no copyright, right? This is purely work for hire. Are they aiding and abetting some kind of weird decimation of publishing? Or are they part of the future? Is this what authors will wind up doing? Because there's no way they can produce fast enough. And the AI content is perfectly fine for the average KU reader. We don't know, right? This is all happening on the fly around us. And because the data, I mean, Amazon is notoriously guarded with all of its data. And publishing, traditional publishing especially, it tends to be guarded because authors don't know their numbers. People who are published by the big five don't know the numbers, don't know their projections, don't know what the real turnaround, don't know what the buyback is. And so those, the absence of those numbers means there's a lot of speculation, a lot of bullshit, and a lot of flim flammery, which makes it hard to know. And then you contrast that with indie publishing where people are very open about their numbers and very willing to talk about ad buys and everything else. And you have sort of a perfect storm for hostility right? Because what seems to be secretiveness may just be literal ignorance because you don't have the information. What seems to be real, real openness may be a kind of braggadocio, braggadocio where they're, they're displaying all this almost like a, a rooster in a hen house. They're a dominance display to keep Madison Avenue at bay. We don't know. And we don't know what the fallout is because all it takes for this all to change is someone at Amazon to say, mm, I don't think it's worth the headache anymore. I yeah. think the congressional oversight of scammers is going to be a pain in the ass. I think the payout to these corporations looks bad on our bottom line. I think our customers are starting to pull out because what they care about is those eyeballs. <laughs> that's, oh, yeah. that's what they want. It's those advertising that's, dollars, right? They need those eyeballs. Well, I, I think that's a real critical thing that people need to think about that are in KU. And I, for a lot of folks, I think it's a great program to be in. But understand Amazon's focus with that is a monthly recurring revenue. Uh-huh. That's what they make money on. Passive focus, income stream. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, and, and what do they think of it? They want to, it's just like Netflix. We mm -hmm. don't want to have churn. We don't want to lose people. We want to keep people in it. There's got to be enough content that they keep doing it. And at the very minimum, we don't even care if they read books. Just don't quit your subscription. Right. Well, it's That's the old, I call that the Soloflex problem. Like back in the, this is how old I am. 
back in the, the days of the 80s when they first started launching infomercials and you would have these gorgeous underwear models that would like use these ridiculous weight yeah. machines on television and everyone would buy the thing thinking, oh, now I'll look like an underwear model, but eventually it became a really expensive sweater rack because yeah, what they yeah. really wanted was for you to buy the equipment. They didn't give a shit what your waistline looked like. They didn't care if you had abs. They just wanted you to buy the thing and it would sit there the same way that gym memberships work. What they want is to sell you a membership that you do not use because that's mm. how they actually increase turnover without having to increase their costs. And so, I mean, if you look at the history of Microsoft, Microsoft realized this back when they turned Office into a subscription service, back when they turned Windows into a subscription service, they realized that what you need is a steady passive income stream, a drip of income. And listen, as authors, we want that too, right? I, I love having a passive income stream, but I cannot be passive about maintaining a passive income stream. I have to be actively cultivating so that the stream can continue to flow. Hmm. Well, and that's, that's what, um, you know, venture capitalists and private equity, that's the companies they put most of their money in is the ones that they can see have a really sticky recurring revenue stream. Right. Sure, the profit. They smell money. I yeah, mean, and it, it's nothing really succeeds easy. like success. They love that, of course. Well, and it's easy to figure out the math, right? It's like, okay, what's the future value or what's the present value of this future cash flow? We could, we could do that math in Excel, right? This is one of the problems, actually, that Hollywood has had in recent years because in Hollywood, everything was a crapshoot. You did a movie with a certain number of stars and based on the people involved and the elements you've assembled, you could guesstimate a certain amount of money but it was always gambling. You had no idea. Mm. Net Netflix has changed all that. Hulu and Amazon have changed all that because they know exactly who's reading and watching and buying everything. They know when they tune out and when they tune in. Everything. Mm. Sirius XM now has the ability to tell when you tune in and tune out from a show. So they can go to a content creator and say, mm, I think that topic is going to go off your radar for a while because on the fly, in real time, they can tell what the interest level is. Imagine a time, I mean, here we are at a time when Netflix knows that after episode four, people stop caring. And so they look at that production team and they're like, well, what happened in episode five that we lost? Where did the stickiness drop off? Yeah, yeah. So this is, I mean, it sounds very big brothery, but actually this is the logical extremity of entertainment. Charles Ludlam, who founded the Ridiculous That's Theatrical Company. what authors need to do if you're writing series. Of course, absolutely. Charles Ludlam, who founded the Ridiculous Theatrical Company, used to say the perfect model for entertainment was a peep show. That if you think about a peep show, what you have is someone attractive and largely naked wiggling in the middle of a room. And if you want to keep watching the wiggling, you put a quarter in. And every, every couple minutes, the curtain comes down and you put another quarter in to keep watching the wiggling. And he used to say the perfect Broadway musical would be every three minutes, the curtain starts to come down. And if you wanted to keep watching, you put a quarter in. And then actually you would wind up paying the same amount for a Broadway musical you would, but it forces the creators to produce a show that keeps you watching. Mm. But I think that's what books do. And I think that when I say like you don't want to lose their attention or you can't afford to have their eyeballs slide off, it's peep show theater. I'm asking you to make sure they keep putting the quarter in the slot because if they don't want to put the quarter in the slot, you've lost them. And that means you personally as an author, as a brand, have ceased to have value for them. There's no reason for them to continue to engage, to continue giving you, to feed the slot because you're showing them, eh, sometimes I don't care if you care. Sometimes I don't care if you have feelings. Sometimes I don't care if you really want to read this. And so what Netflix very cleverly has done is found a way to make sure that they keep feeding the slot. It's what yeah. Amazon is doing. It's what Hulu is doing. It's what Sirius is doing. These are these models of ongoing passive subscription that allow people to never not be entertained. They are constantly entertained. And the moment they start to feel bored, you failed. Mm. That's terrifying. <laughs> That's terrifying. Well, man, it's been great having you on. Oh, thank you. We got dark there at the end. We got a little well, dark well, there. We kind of brought that, right? Because it was the same thing. It's about you have to figure out what keeps your reader, your 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 customer, your audience emotionally engaged. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah. So no, I think that that it's been great having you on. And um, why don't you tell folks like where they can find you? Um, we didn't talk about it too much, but your, your book, Verbalize, maybe you mentioned. They can find. I mean, it's online. I am findable everywhere. Fine ebooks are sold, and actually any books are sold. Um, I'm the only Damon Swade. So if you go to DamonSwade.com, D-A-M-O-N-S-U-E-D-E.com. I'm also on Twitter as Damon Swade. Facebook is Damon Swade. I'm pretty much everywhere. 
I have two books, uh, two nonfiction books for writers uh, for craft, which are Verbalize, which is about my technique, Activate, which is a 270,000 word thesaurus of verbs, the only one in the world. And um, I have a marketing book that I wrote, co-wrote with uh, Heidi Cullinan called Your A-Game, which is winning promo for genre fiction. Because when I first got into genre fiction, the marketing books were not so great. Um, but yeah, so, uh, but I'm pretty much findable everywhere. I teach a lot. I travel a lot. I'm, I was in, I think, 39 cities last year, so I'm probably coming to a city near you soon. Um, but Joe, thank you so much for having me on. It's been really great. Thanks for having me on. We'll have you on again. Thanks a lot, right. David. Thanks, man.